Okay, good evening. Welcome. Are you ready for another adventure? <laughs> we have these exquisite evening adventures together. Well, the, last night's movie, um, it was very, very helpful, I think, for, for all of us um, in terms of really getting in touch with some very profound emotions. Also, uh, I heard that this afternoon, too, with the dyads, there were many tears and there was uh, lots of healing. Sava even said to me, she said, the temperature in the room just went way up. It just felt the whole room got hot uh, because uh, the emotions just came up. And then now you're, that's really getting into the healing when the emotions come to the surface because that was the question we were addressing at the end of the morning session about what do you do with the unconscious mind or the subconscious mind if it's, if it's assumed to be true. And Jesus uh, tells us that whenever we have uh, an idea or a concept that we will not raise to question, it's an, it's an assumption, when that drops down into the unconscious mind, it turns into a belief. Isn't that interesting <laughs> that assumptions that are unquestioned are down there running the show, so to speak, running what we're perceiving and they turn into beliefs when they're subconscious. So that's why it's so important to raise the darkness to the light and it's so important to get in touch with these uh, beliefs. Some of them are so assumed and they're so deep and they're so buried that they're very seldom uh, talked about in a conscious way. They don't make it up into the, the conscious conversations uh, that much, except the assumptions show themselves as being assumed to be true. For example, time, linear time. When you go on a first date, usually people don't go out for dinner and discuss whether time is real or not on a first date. That might kind of be a showstopper. You, you, you may not get a second date if you start asking, do you believe in time? Do you believe in linear time? And then, you know, it could be a pretty shocking uh, conversation. What do you mean, do I believe in time? You know, it's, it's almost like asking a fish, uh, do you believe in water? You know, and the fish is like, what are you talking about? I mean, what, what does that even mean? And yet, we have some amazing devices. Uh, we have some clips and some mini-movies and some things that, that go right at the core belief in linear time. I would say simultaneity or simultaneous time uh, is, is a closer approximation of, of coming into the quantum field where everything is simultaneous. So there really aren't even parallel lifetimes or uh, past lives and future lives. Uh, Gary Bernard's book, Disappearance of the Universe and Art and Persa and Past Lives and Future Lives, although I, Gary's a friend of mine and I know recently he was on a, a a podcast with a friend of ours from uh, Ohio named Carl Gruber and and then Gary admitted kind of toward the end of the podcast he said there really there really is no such thing as reincarnation he said you don't really incarnate at all that's just you know that's a mechanism and it and just like Dan Brown's books and Mary Magdalene and Jesus and where they're romantic and all this it's you know it can you can get off into a lot of of fiction and fantasy that doesn't really come to the point of healing, but collapsing time and and going into these mystical experiences where you you can sometimes get a glimpse of the simultaneity of time. And basically, Jesus even does this with his course. He says he says there's the unholy instant, which he calls the tiny tick of time, the tiny moment of terror. And then there's the holy instant. So basically, it's amazing that all of time basically comes down to what am I going to invest in and what am I going to want? 
the holy instant of perfect innocence, the present moment that Eckhart talks about that takes you to eternity, or the unholy instant, which is just the past. If you squish the past down to just one instant, it's this time of terror that Jesus is talking about. So the, the holy instant is actually a choice, and, and the unholy instant is a choice. And in the end, it does come down to, do I believe in and, and want the past, or do I believe in and want the present? And the present moment isn't really, it isn't even in between the past and future. You see how hoodwinked we've all been. We tend, remember our history classes ever? You know, they draw the big timeline and they put the arrows on the chalkboard. And guess where they put the present? In the middle of the past and the future. They don't tell us. Uh, you have to go to Jesus Christ who says the present is before time was. Remember that in the Bible? Before Abraham was, I am. Look at the grammar of that sentence. Before Abraham was, I am. There's people ready to stone him for that, for saying such a thing. Again, not an easy conversation starter. Uh, you know, it, I would not use this on a date. Uh, but, but it just shows us what Jesus tells us in the beginning of the workbook, that he says... We need, you need new time ideas. So he's actually built that into his mind training system in the workbook to wash away all sense of the past and use your ability that was developed through the ego. It's called memory. There's no memories in heaven because it's just isness. But memory was made by the ego and Jesus says you're, you're accustomed to believe that you can only use memory in relationship to the past, but you can actually remember the present, and it will take you all the way back to eternity. So he's working with us with with an ability that that was made to keep us stuck, and now of course he turns the table and says, actually I can use it to get you home, like he does with everything else. So what I'd like to do tonight is, last night we just, you know, we were all... I could tell we were all just so entertained by that movie and also very inspired. Years ago, I started to realize for myself that, that I said, um, I really enjoy music and I enjoy movies. And there was a pretty strong entertainment value for me with movies. I would, I would go to movies to be entertained. And there was a bit of escapism, you know, Movies are exciting, and new adventures, and new scenes, new characters, new scenarios. You know, it, I think I was using it to kind of escape from maybe a sense of boredom, or escape from the mundane. And I could tell myself I was expanding my horizons, but there was a part of me that was just in there to be entertained by the movie. But when I've talked with Jesus about this, he says, well, actually... If you start to train your mind to watch movies in a different way, uh, if you start to use movies solely for mind watching, almost like we call them movie meditations, where you pay attention very closely to your feelings, you pay attention closely to your thoughts, that the movies can actually be tools to help you get in touch with your subconscious mind. You know, it, it actually can be extremely helpful, not as an entertainment device, but as a tool that you use to learn how to watch your mind, how to watch the world. And, and especially if you practice with movies, then you can start transferring that to your daily life. And there's a huge transfer value then, because you start to actually forgive and really deepen in the forgiveness practice, and it helps you with even when what the world would call emergency crisis situations arise, you've got this great mind-watching practice that you've been practicing with with movies, and you're calm, you're still, you're observant, you're aligned, you're connected. You, you are actually reaching higher and higher in your forgiveness practice. So initially when I would show movies, I would do a lot of commentary and so forth, but actually I would have people use them as like music and movie meditations. 
to practice with stepping back in your mind and observing. So in, you can still enjoy the movie. I thoroughly enjoy the movies, but I'm very attentive in particular to the feelings that arise and to the thoughts that are there. And that's why I do like to, instead of always being in theater, I'd like to be able to rent the movies or stream the movies or whatever so I can pause it. Because in the early days I would go to Blockbuster Video or something, Jesus would say, this movie is for you, this one, this one. I'd go home, I'd watch the movie, I'd start crying or all kinds of emotions would come up. And then Jesus would say, pause the movie and just be with this for a while. So it was like movie spiritual psychotherapy with Jesus Christ. Uh, and it was actually very helpful. Uh, or if, if I couldn't pause the movie, he would take me out to a movie theater and I would watch the movie and I'd be all emotional after the movie and if there was nobody there, I would just, they would, and they would let me, I would stay in the theater, I would go to my car and I would fog up the car for a couple hours as Jesus gave me instructions. You know, I'd say, wow, that was a scary movie. He said, no, the movie wasn't scary. <laughs> Your mind is scary. <laughs> And here's what we're going to do about that. And he would take me in and show me where I was afraid. What I believed in that was the fear that I was projecting onto the scary movie. He'd say, you know, boy, that was a funny movie. He said, no, your mind is funny. <laughs> you know, the movie's neutral. Uh, nothing I see means anything. I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. You know, he'd come back through the lessons and he would educate me on looking at the movies in a new way, and he would do all this, uh, sometimes hours of spiritual psychotherapy to show me in a very helpful way uh, with lots of instruction uh, on what was going on in my mind and what I was projecting onto the screen. So I'd like you tonight, we'll, we'll just step up from last night, I, I just want you particularly to be attentive to your, your feelings and your thoughts. And perhaps if we have some time after the movie, you can even come up to the front row and maybe you can just share, wow, what, what emerged from the subconscious during this movie? This movie, uh, our last movie was Jack, and, you know, Jack certainly wanted to have some success in his terms of, of playing in front of an audience, and he didn't seem to have a lot of that going on at the beginning. And his manager, Ellie, you know, it was really more about their connection and, and, and the beginnings of him starting to open his heart up. But in tonight's movie, uh, those temptations of fame and fortune, which Jack, he started to go down that road. You'll remember that time when Jack's manager with the blonde hair said to him, you, I want you to drink the chalice. <laughs> the poison chalice, she called it. Yeah. I thought, well, that's pretty obvious right there when they call it a poison chalice. <laughs> and she's saying pretty aggressively, you know, I want you to, to tell me this is what you want because you're going to make a lot, we'll make, we'll make a lot of money. She wanted to make a lot of money too and she wanted him to be part of that. But I have to say, you know, one thing about Jack is ultimately you could just see it on his face. He wasn't that enticed by the fame and the image and, and the money. So it wasn't really that difficult for him to go up on the stage and basically give all his music away for free and just basically renounce those temptations. He, he did it. In tonight's movie... Uh, the main character is going to have a lot of unconscious darkness, feelings of lack, feelings of not being loved, not being nurtured, and then will get tempted in a much greater way by, by the fame and, and by the fortune. So, in other words, if, if we had to look at the two movies, uh, Jack took a sip of the chalice. Uh, our main character tonight, he's going to chug it down. <laughs> he's chugging it down. He's chugging down the 
poison chalice. And of course, that's going to make for more drama. Uh, because there are other trappings that come with fame and fortune. And a lot of times, uh, people do end up at 12-step meetings uh, with some major seeming addictions in form, even though, as I said, judgment in the mind is really the central, it's the one addiction. But it plays out in many ways, and the mind can get so lost in form and so tangled up in the complexities of the ego and its many, many defense mechanisms, many, many distractions, many ways to numb out, to try to avoid facing your feelings, facing your thoughts, facing your beliefs. This world is just full of, of options, seeming options. Uh, they're all invented by the ego to keep you from knowing who you are. So I think that's really the benefit of, of tonight's movie because you're going to get to see these things play out in a much more extreme form, I think, than, than last night's movie. Why is that valuable? Uh, I think of Jesus in the Course and, and he's saying, um, my part in uh, my teaching part, or part of my teaching part, was the crucifixion. Uh, you are not asked to be crucified, but you are asked to share my perspective of forgiveness with seemingly less intense <laughs> uh, situations than being on a cross bleeding to death over a number of hours. You know, it's almost like that's, that's just an extreme form of, of a temptation to believe you're a body. And he's saying, you're going to have, I'm just asking you to follow my example of forgiveness with less extreme uh, situations than the crucifixion. You know, you don't have to worry, you're not going to have to go through the same thing. That was my contribution, he said. Your contribution will be different. Maybe it'll be through music or song or hula hooping or <laughs> some, something. We do have a friend who, who's a great hula hooper for God named Sean. He, I mean, he's a really good at it, too. He, he really, it's like a meditation watching Sean hula hoop. But it's, he, he uses it, I think, as a meditation practice. It's, he's very skilled. But you may have it play out in many different ways without having to go through a crucifixion scene. But I think that's the value tonight of this movie, is you'll, you really can watch your emotions and just pay attention to what's going on. So if you seem to get triggered by various scenes, um, then pay close attention to that, and then just continue to observe as, as you go forward with the movie. Also, um, there's a friend of mine here in Europe who is a very dedicated uh, Course of Miracles student and a, a dedicated musician. And um, he's loving to put together Course of Miracles songs. And then I happened to see one of his music videos today. His name is Frank, and he's from uh, Sweden. Some of you might be aware of him. But I thought before we start to watch the, the main event, I could have Frank be your warm-up band tonight to guide you through one of his amazing Course in Miracles songs to set your mind in a very beautiful state of mind before the movie. Because it's like a, a reminder. It's kind of like a, a little preparation before you go into it. And Frank is so sweet and he's so dedicated to really honoring the deep teachings of the Course, you know, not, he's not trying to dance around or water it down, he's just trying to tune in to a frequency that, that brings in some of these very high ideas in, in very lovely music. And I, I think the, the quality of his music videos has just gotten better and better. So, without further ado, settle back into your mind-watching <laughs> position <laughs> for tonight. And remind yourself that you're just going to pay attention to those feelings and to those thoughts. And uh, first we'll enjoy Frank and his beautiful music video to get you set. And then we'll go right into the movie of the night. So enjoy. <laughs> There is 
There's nothing here to change There is no one here to blame True forgiveness is the key To restore my sanity I am never upset For the reason I think I've given everything I see All the meaning it has for me Now I'm determined to see All things differently I'm upset cause I see something That's not there So very good, our mind-watching exercise of the night. Wow, very good. We have some seats up here. If any of you have any nice raw emotions that have bubbled up from the unconscious mind that are part of the healing that you want to share with, with all of our brothers and sisters here, we would be honored honored to hear it. We've got a, a microphone standing by there. Oh yes, thank you so much. This is a new way to watch movies and heal. I don't know what to say now again, but it's again a shot middle in the rose. Apologize for my English because it's not perfect and well Elton John was the favorite of my mom, and I danced on with her on the music of Elton John at home. <laughs> and and um, well, I had my coming out when I was 21, so I can identify myself with the inner and outer world of Elton John for 100 percent. And you know, the circumstances were different, but the same idea. And it's. A, I come from a very negative paradigm because I was, I would like to be straight, get wife, children, house, career, that, that kind of things. And I know it just was just a lie for me. It couldn't work. And secretly I felt in love with boys and, and in the soccer team. And I built up my fantasy world. Anyway, 21 coming out and then I said, I'm free, I guess, I'm free. And after a few months, I just said to myself, well, nothing to lose, just make your world. And I get, I get happy in a way. And, and I made the second mistake. 
the pitfall that I would like to have a special relationship, like in a gay marriage. Uh, stupid, you know. It's, why a special relationship? So I get a few times, I get very um, in love with someone who wasn't in love with me, and they get psychotic three times. They forced me to the mental hospital, and after three times, I said, I never want to be psychotic again. I just finished my law study, and I'm going to be a lawyer at the Legal Aid Center. And went to Thailand, and fuck up Jesus, fuck up the God. I, I was just fed up with the whole Catholic system I came from. And, and the Buddha made me happy, I thought. And I make fun like Elton John with the man in Thailand. And after 30 years, I was, I was missing. You know, I, I just, uh, I have to wing my cousin, Koos Janssen. And because I didn't saw him for 30, 40 years, I said, uh, I want to be a, I want to have a spiritual path, and can you help me? And he said something about the Course of Miracles. I said, what, what's that Course of Miracles? Never heard of it. I just come to one of my sessions, and I start to get argue with him about all kinds of things, and my ego protests to everything. I, well, um, but I trusted him. That's because he was my cousin. I love his my cousin. And, just said, go on, Paul. And for 10 years I did the course, and, and slowly, you know, it was like, what's happening here? You know, it's Jesus calls you, and when you are in Thailand, just go to the Buddha when you're there. But if you're here, come to me, to Jesus, because this is your roots here. And, and, and your God is not the God of love, it's just the God of the church. And, I get, you know, flushing and, well, that's the end of, I'm now here, just the end of the story, and I want to be in the present now, I want to leave my fantasy world, my loneliness, my fake ideas, and just get all the rubbish away, and Jesus, he'll have, that's it. Uh, it's so beautiful. Like, you are on such a roll these last few weeks. CDs, Beatles music coming, pouring in. You were shutting down. You were closing down. You were trying to hide away. And uh, like the Beatles say, you can't hide your love away. The Spirit came in. Jesus, the, this Holy Spirit came in. First with the music to get you out of the kind of the closed down little stupor. And then get you here for more Beatles last night and then just when Jesus has you where he wants you he brings in Elton yeah. to say look at Elton Elton came through all that you came through the same things and you're still standing yes I never give up and, and I, I you know it's I didn't know this is just a dream this is just all projection and love is just extending and I didn't know about this all I just just start to wake up I guess that's all that's you're it. ready you're ready and the, and the thing is when you go through all that you you it's almost like in the East where you negate all these things when you read the course and it talks about special relationships you can start to grasp what that is and you can see it act it out and brings it even home closer and closer because basically what we're learning is that if we really could see past all the disguises and the forms and the seeming alluring attractions, we would start to see, I don't want this thing. Whatever this thing is, it's a substitute for heaven and I am worth heaven. I'm worth reality and I don't have to go for this thing. And that's the way you you escape it. You have to see it for the first time. So it sounds like even this movie tonight and that movie last night are just really bringing it into focus for you. It, because Jesus says, if you really could see the ego straight on without any disguises, you would say, I have no need for you at all. 
and I'm not going to fall for your tricks anymore. I've been through this enough. I've, I'm through with the suffering. Yeah. And like, like um, yesterday, who was that man, Jack? His computer crashed a little bit. You know, my computer is also crashing for a lot of weeks. I said, just switch it off. There's something happening here. I have to listen to another voice, whatever. It's well, amazing. I, I, cannot, I, I cannot put it in other words, just miraculous. Isn't Thank it you. great to know that, that nothing ever really breaks? That at things in your life that even seem to be there that you became accustomed to, when they start to fall away, crack, fade, disappear, there's something inside you that can rejoice and say, bye-bye, I don't miss you <laughs> anymore. I remember about, I don't know, years and years ago, I had a friend from Europe here, from England, who uh, named Dorothy, and one time she, she took a trip back over from the States over to here to Europe, and she said the funniest thing happened when she got over here and the plane landed, her wristwatch uh, quit working. And um, so she went into a, like a, a jeweler or a place where they look at, could look at the watch and they had it for about a week or two to fix it. And then they gave it back to her and she put it on, she went off. It still wouldn't work. And we just howled laughing at the spirit giving her a watch where that it couldn't even keep time anymore. <laughs> And we laugh for 20 minutes at how playful Jesus is and how playful the Spirit is. Because even when things start to break down, dismantle, crack open, fall apart, you can still laugh. You can laugh all the way when everything else falls away because you still have love. And love is waiting for you to, to know itself, you know, it just wants to be known. And sometimes things have to seem to fall away. So I'm so glad. Thank you for giving your testimony and coming here and sharing with all of us how you got here and how you appreciate uh, what you're being shown. Because it's very obvious. It's like the Spirit is saying, thank you so much. We'll make this more and more obvious that this is a dream and you're ready to wake up. Thank you very much too. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Hello, David. Hello, hi. everyone. Hi, hi. Well, um, with the scene, uh, he was sitting at the table with his father and mother, and th they so rejected him, and they so exposed no love to him. I was crying. <laughs> And I, yeah, I felt uh, my sad, my own sadness, and, uh, and and I was thinking, well, I cannot imagine that when in your little childhood you 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 are not getting this love of your parents, how can you survive? How how can you find love in uh, yourself in in your life? And Elton was exposing this. He. He didn't believe in himself that he could feel the love. And, well, that's what I felt a great part of my life. So I am not able to love, to feel love for somebody. And, and that's not what my mirror told me, because I felt other people loved me. But there was something in front of me I couldn't get through and feel that I was able to love and well so and in this film I get back in this story and I really was believing no it isn't it, it's not possible when you didn't get this love from your parents it's impossible to to feel love in your life but then well further on in the movie there were things were said like uh, uh, you you can ask help always and 
his there were all the other people who were there for him, his friend and yeah. So, but he he couldn't receive this love, and I, well, that I recognized it so much. So I I felt all my own pain, but now I'm here and I'm sitting here with all the people, and we are doing the course, and so this is strengthening me that yes, it is possible, whatever happens in your life, but. Yeah, I, I, I went through all the feelings of really despair when I saw this movie. And, and, and at the end, I, I also felt, okay, yes, it is possible. <laughs> so I, it was the roller coaster of Elton John, was my roller coaster watching the movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's an amazing, he was telling his dad that time, you know, you should. You know, you're lucky, Dad. Not everyone gets a second chance, but how all of us have the capacity to change our mind about everything. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's like that spark in there, that flame that will never go out. We have the capacity, as Jesus says, to change your mind about your mind. One time I asked Jesus, I said, what do you mean, change your mind about your mind? He said, Remember your eternity. You always have the power to remember your eternity. Kind of like that movie, The Wizard of Oz. When, you know, Dorothy goes through with the flying monkeys and this wicked looking witch with a long nose and, ah, my pretty. <laughs> and all this stuff. And I mean, really spooky stuff. You know, they showed us movies like that when we were kids. We're like traumatized. <laughs> we don't want to go to sleep after watching The Wizard of Oz. And then, then we get, no, remember Glenda the Good Witch. Dorothy, Dorothy, you always had the power to go home. You always softly, always gently had the power to go home. Just click your heels together and say, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. Oh yeah, there's that gentle voice reminding us we always have the power to change our mind. We don't have to stay in, in duality. We don't have to stay in suffering. We can, change our, we can change the direction of our thinking. Okay, maybe the direction of our thinking has been guilt and fear and pain and, and suffering, but we can change the direction of our thinking. We can control the direction of our thinking. We need help, but we can control the direction of our thinking. We can think with God instead of trying to think against God. It's possible to think with God. Only my loving thoughts are true. Everything else is an appeal for healing and help. And you can remember only the love. Our perception is selective. We can choose to select the miracle and change everything that we perceive about ourself and about everyone and about the world. Thank God that that's there. And not only that, look around at all the mighty companions that have been sent. Look at all the witnesses a room full of witnesses to walk with us side by side. Elton had Bernie. Yeah. Bernie was there smiling all the way at the end, visiting him in the, the place where he was, that house or that institution. And when Elton started talking about in, in the darkness and everything, and uh, thinking that that was still who he was, and and how he'd hurt people and all this, you saw that big wide smile on Bernie's face. Not buying it. You can't fool me. <laughs> and you know, we have that power to give that away. You know, to be that person and to go inward to our mind to be the one who can see the innocence, who cannot buy the error no matter what anybody is saying. We can offer that gift of love and innocence and then we're really giving ourselves that same gift when we give it to our, our brother and sister. 
So thank you for witnessing to that because, you know, that's a testimony that we can change. We don't have to. People can change. You know, it really that's the symbol the mind can change from from hatred to forgiveness. Yes, there's one thing I want to share that's what happened in the afternoon with uh, the, the, the dialogue we did. So I was talking about my uh, self-judgment and afterwards in the group uh, someone was saying uh, there where you put your attention to that grows. And then I, that came so to me because then I realized yes when I give my attention to my self-judgment, it grows. But I, I can give my attention to something else, to the opposite. So, and that gave me a big power. So I thank the man who said it this afternoon. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Hello. Hi. Hello, David. Um, what um, triggered me um, was the the pain, the the pain of self hate, um, and the twelve step part. And um, I've been in twelve step program for more than ten years now. And I discovered A Course in Miracles uh, more than 30 years ago. And um, it's really the path of my heart. I'm so very grateful uh, for the Course. I've cried so many tears of gratitude for Jesus for this book. And it gave me such strong glimpses of of my my innocence and I saw such a friendly world and I've been so close and so so close so so grateful to see such friendliness and, but um, at the same time um, in between I've been much addicted I've had many addictions, strong ones. Um, drugs, uh, marijuana when I was an adolescent, and alcohol, and really I drank too much and every day and I needed to drink every day and when it wasn't there I, I just went out to, to get it and I had to drink myself to sleep. And, and then uh, also the strongest one is, is sex addiction searching for erotic stories um, before the internet and when the internet was there it became even more and um, and I have had terrible fears because of that because because I went too far I, I felt like like an elastic when you pull to pull it too hard when you go too far I I, I went too far in searching outside of myself, in, in distraction. And um, that brought me to the 12-step program. And I remember that when I was there, I was talking about the course, because I love the course so much. And then one fellow said, um, please stop about the course. This is not a course in miracles group. And the course ha hasn't made you sober. I was very angry because I wanted the course to have made me sober just out of gratitude toward Jesus. And on another level, I understood just, uh, he was right, the fellows. I, I, I shut up about the course. And and thanks to the 12-step program, I became sober. And the first line of my sobriety prayer is, uh, God, please let me make sobriety the most important thing today because uh, sobriety is the, the ground 
where all the, the, the pathway to God lies. So before there is a pathway to God, there has to be a ground for that path. And that's so important, is it? And I want to be humble. It's only since the 12-step program that I could, could continue my pathway with A Course in Miracles. And I almost was afraid to go here because it felt like that's, that's the highest level for me and I'm afraid to become like Icarus and, and become arrogant and fly too high and fall down. I want to stay sober and I stay sober and there can be this pathway towards God. I'm so, I'm so grateful for, for God, for Jesus, the Holy Spirit. I'm so, I'm so grateful. I've been so extremely afraid. I'm so grateful for the, for the safety and the refugee and, and the protection and, and that I'm really saving God's arms now. I just want to say that. Thank you. Thank you. What a gift. We offer that prayer to the whole universe. And here on John Lennon's birthday, we honor Dr. Bob. We honor Bill Wilson. We honor the big book. We honor all those 12-step groups all over the country, all over the world that have been going for decades. And as a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful pathway to God. And then... Even as you go through the 12 steps, you, when you come to 12, you know, you have to maintain that continuing contact with the higher power. And so I see that the Course is just an addition for you, but, the, but you've got to stay with the core. I always tell people, stay with the core that heals you. Stay with the core that is your ground that takes you. And, and it's almost like that core will be with you the the connection and the and the joy and the and the gratitude for what keeps you sober is always there will always be in your heart and will literally help propel you higher and higher and higher and so in one sense that's something that will never leave you and so many people i know have witnessed the very same thing that you're sharing tonight with us I'm so glad I do it, and because I'm so glad that you love the 12 step program and honor it, because I'm sometimes afraid for arrogance on my part, like leaving that, oh, that's, I even had thoughts, the big book, they call it the big book, ah, the course, that's a real big book, it's much bigger. <laughs> so I, I don't want to go there, you see? Yeah. yeah, no comparison here. Yes. It's all, <laughs> yeah. all up and up into to love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, I, I'm so touched by, by how the Spirit can turn anything around because when you were sharing all those addictions and that's how this movie started off with, with uh, Elton there at the 12-step group and just saying, I'm, I'm a sex addict, I'm a cocaine addict, I'm a shopaholic. I'm, you know, he just was, I'm addicted to all these things. That's the beginning of healing. And... Um, I actually uh, have a man who began some years ago writing to me from prison and our connection has just grown deeper and deeper and deeper. He's in for murder. You've talked about all the things you've done in your life and the addictions. I don't think you've killed anybody. But uh, he wrote to me, he's, he's in prison for a, a long time for murder. and. He got a hold of the course, and he got a hold of my books, and he's, of course, there. He's uh, he's a captive audience uh, for uh, for this stuff, and his name is Dale, and I'm telling you, I I even talk about him when I do, have done an online retreat, and and I've gone through his letters. He writes, he wrote his letter to me in red letters, red ink handwritten and I went through online one time, did a whole session line by line of Dale facing the darkness. He was a boxer. He was a professional boxer, really a, a good one, who was on ESPN and, and everything. He killed a man. He got deeper into the course. He got deeper into my teachings. And then at one point where he thought, 
I'm, I'll start to teach this here in prison. I'm doing pretty good. Then the family of the man that he murdered said, we want to meet you. And he's like, oh, oh, what's this? I said, yep, you're, you're going to get to face everything in your unconscious mind now when the family comes and starts asking all the questions. Why, you know, and all the things. You're going to have to pray and let the Spirit speak through you. And he opened himself wide to that and he's just like yourself, is just healing and healing and rising up and rising up. So it just, you're a, a great example that through all that that you went through in your life, you're coming sober. Elton, all that he went through, 28 years sober, and, and opening his heart up and still healing and healing. You know, these are the kind of witnesses we actually need to hear and hear about the Dales, hear about you, hear about what people have gone through because it helps give people faith and, and it helps strengthen in them that they can face whatever they're facing. And so thank you for coming up here and just being so lovingly transparent about everything. It's really a blessing for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. This afternoon with the diets, um, I'm coming across a lot of Pretense, masks, and uh, finding out unworthiness and specialness are actually the same. I have to sort of keep up a mask, being special, not to feel the unworthiness inside. And this movie was into the extreme of what a high maintenance it is to keep up the mask and the pretense. And that you have to go further and further and get more crazy and more crazy because not to be exposed. And um, I'm so sick and tired to keep up the mask and I'm so ready to give it up. All these self-concepts and... Because it really tires me out and... Yeah, I think I'm not a, that extreme as Elton John, but, but in a way it's the same, I can see that. And... Um, it's only a call for love. When will you hug me? And your whole life builds on that. Looking for a hug. Yeah, it's amazing to see it so clearly acted out of this idea of the deep feelings of, of unworthiness, like please love me, and then it's played out in terms of developing a mask or a self-concept and then, yeah, somehow it seems to help it to see it so extreme and to see it is just the spinning, like his world was just, at times the way they filmed it was just like spinning around with different masks and then another mask, an extreme mask and exaggerated costumes and, and everything uh, but underneath it, this cry, you know, please, somebody please love me, somebody please see me, somebody please honor me, somebody please recognize me. And uh, the thing I think that helped me when I was going through a lot of the self-judgment and criticism and anger, just rage coming up, coming up, was... Of course, rage has to have a target. You know, we always have people or situations in mind when there's rage. You know, it's it's got a specific 
target in the world. And then something lifted in my mind one day from, you did this to me, you did that, I'll never forget this, and how dare you, and you know, all those kind of raging, angry thoughts, to, to this gentle presence inside, uh, reminding me, like I was saying today, that when Jesus said, when you came to this world, you brought the world with you. Uh, it, it came in a soft way. It said, uh, say it this way, David. You need to reframe it. You need to turn it around in your mind. And it was, I taught the world to teach me. I had to get that first part in there. I taught the world to teach me. I learned this fearful world to reinforce, to teach me that I wasn't loved, that I wasn't worthy. But it, instead of the world did this to me and I'm a victim of all these things, these terrible things that I have memories of, I taught the world to teach me. Somehow that brought in that, if I can teach the world to do that, to teach me, I must be able to teach the world to teach me something different. I, maybe I can finally learn to teach the kingdom to the kingdom. Maybe I can, as it says, teach only love, for that is what you are. I can come back to that core and say, whatever it was, no matter how dark the unworthiness is, I can, I can change. I can, I can turn it. And, and every little, it gives you gratitude for every miracle. Every miracle. Because... Yeah, we, we met, we came together, we, we went through a retreat, you came all the way over there to, to Utah for was that 30-day mystery school. And it wasn't easy. It was more like there was a lot of darkness that came up. And in one sense, it was almost like a cocoon. Like that was a lot to give yourself permission to come and allow that even to come up, you have to really congratulate yourself, your mind, for, for giving permission. Because that's the beginning of the turnaround, is this authenticity, is this transparency. It's even speaking it up, saying, I can't hide behind these roles anymore. They're killing me. They're, they're weights, they're weighing me down. And, and I deserve love. I deserve happiness and joy and I can't experience that if I hold on and I keep clinging to these roles and these masks. And it's okay if the ego is going to scream and shout at me and tell me I'm guilty and everything, then come on, bring it on. If that all, is that the best you can do? <laughs> That's Sometimes you have to say that to the ego. Like Truman in the Truman Show. You know, when he finally makes it in the water and he's He's trying to make it over to the edge to, to find a way out of the show. And then Kristoff, you know, the ego character, says, hit him again, hit him again. Like, really, you're going to drown him. He's the star of the show, you're going to drown him and everything. And then Truman utters those beautiful words as he's coming out of almost drowning. And he's all wet, and he's laying there, all strapped in the, caught in the rope, and he says, Is that the best you can do? <laughs> That's what you have to say to a death wish. <laughs> Is that the best you can do to try to kill me? Because there's a spark in me, there's a flame in me, there's a light in me that can't be killed. It won't go out. And it's so strong, you know, we've just identified in this world with all these other things that we call strength. But blessed are the meek, for they shall overcome the world. And they shall overcome it in gentleness, and they shall come overcome it in the strength of the meekness of Christ. The gentleness is where the strength is. And you have that, Lisbeth, in your heart. You've got a gentleness that's in there, that's still and quiet. In the midst of the storm, it still remains untouched, impervious. It is, it is invulnerable. 
It is so strong, it is invulnerable. And that's really what this is all about. You're just going to tap into that. And like the phoenix, you're going to rise up and rise up in the light because, because it's destined. Because it's destined. Because God never forgot, never forgets us, never forgets the truth of us. So thank you. That's very, very courageous. Very, very courageous. You were very courageous at the mystery school and you're you're still very courageous and and you know as they say I may be down but I am not out and I will rise up again I will stand I'm still standing as Elton shared you know you're still standing yeah thank, thank you. you thank you beautiful Once again, I sit here, <laughs> very shaken. Um, I'm so grateful to have uh, enjoyed alcohol sobriety for just over six years. I just had my anniversary last month. I did it on my own without AA, um, which I'm told is pretty rare. I'm grateful for that. I had the course, and I had the knowledge that um, that I deserved to be loved, and the course helped me realize that it was all my doing. And after I got through the guilt and the judgment that I has, had done that to myself, that I had written a script of depression and death, for myself and that I hated myself. I'm so glad to be beyond that and to be on this beautiful path. I met my husband a couple of years ago and he introduced me to AA and was sober when we met. And uh, he's now in ICU and has fallen so far off the wagon. I just, it happened like a week before I came here. And I just have no idea what's what's going to happen if he's going to. I just don't know. He's been offered so much love and so much care by me and others. And he has an AA family. But I knew, I've always known that he was going to fall and that he was going to crash. And I've seen him crash many times. And this is a, he's just crashed and he's not getting back up. And they have him medicated so much because every time he wakes up, he tries to hurt himself or somebody else. So he's just completely out of reach. And I'm the only one reaching out to him now. I'm the only one calling to find out if he's... just what's going on. He's completely isolated. He doesn't have anybody there. And I hurt so badly for what he must be going through. To just refuse to accept the love. And I've been dealing with a lot of judgment and guilt about how I respond when he relapses. He's, re he's relapsed multiple times since we've met. Our relationship has triggered it, I believe. Uh, we joined in the purpose of, of healing our minds, not for the sake of the marriage, and that terrifies him. And um, he's just lost in the darkness that he's never been able to really look at and, and dig into. Um, there's a lot there for him to deal with. And I know that I can't do that for him. Nobody can do it for him. And so I'm... He's just kind of hanging out there. Um, but I have my work to do, and there's been such an incredible amount of judgment against myself. And I look at this movie, and I think, well, if I'm Bernie, I'm being a pretty shitty Bernie. Because I react out of anger when he drinks at first. And I get so just fed up with it. 
And I yelled at him when he called me and admitted to me that he was drinking a couple weeks ago. Um, But my right mind comes in and I realize that it's a call for love and that I want to answer the call for love with love. But the guilt is just so strong because he's fallen so hard and I just don't know if he's ever going to come back. I don't even know if his brain will function. I mean, it's, I don't know. So I've been looking at all of this and, and just trying to give it all away to spirit and just trust that even though this seems very tragic and uh, there's just this cloud of death hanging over my, my dear, dear, mighty partner, my holy partner, who knows how to love others so much but cannot accept it for himself that Holy Spirit has him in this dark place where he can't even wake up without being violent towards himself or others. This man that I've only known as being sweet and kind and gentle. So the range of emotion has been pretty intense with... This retreat was planned, of course, back months ago, and he fully supports that and supports everything that's that comes with that. For me, for my own growth, he sees the beauty in me. I've been praying to Holy Spirit, and I see my husband in front of me, surrounded in light, and telling me that I'm loved, to prop me up so that I can do my work and so that I can be in peace. There's also... The realization that he's not some separate guy floating around out there. He is part of my mind. And when I got the call that he had fallen, and he told me that he... I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I think you should divorce me. Because I can't keep doing this to you. I said, what about you? What are you doing to yourself? You do this to both of us. We both hurt from this. It's just all so... Strange, and yet it, yet it all seems really orchestrated at the same time. But I'm doing what I can to take responsibility for this. I know he has his own journey, but I get the deep sense that until I accept love and accept my true function, he will not accept his. We're very joined in mind, we are joined in mind. And watching this, I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me with this movie selection. Um, I'm not really sure what else to say. I just really have been working on just bringing this to Holy Spirit. and, And every day earlier today, a whole wave of guilt hit me again about answering his call for love with with anger. And then I can feel good and feel trusting in spirit and then it and then it just the wave comes back again, the wave of guilt and judgment. So I just wanted to air all of that and expose it once again with all of you, all of my brothers and sisters, so um so that healing can occur. And so that I can be at peace. And so all of us can be at peace. Because I, I know what that is like. I have a lot of ego to heal. But I know what it's like to want to die. To just hate so much that there's no way out but to destruct. You just can't face yourself. And I feel for anybody who's gone through that. But I want to take responsibility as well. And not play the victim game and pretend that I'm my partner's victim just as Elton did in this movie yeah. So. yeah that's the one word I kept hearing while you were talking it's is the word responsibility and I know for Christians um, one of the strongest symbols for Christians is the cross and for many Christians they it's misunderstood. They see the cross as uh, 
as a symbol of the crucifixion and the ultimate sacrifice uh, for for the sins of mankind. And what's so beautiful about the course is uh, Jesus is coming through with the course and saying, uh, You have not sinned, but you have made a mistake. And Jesus says, there's a big difference between a sin and an error. And you have to realize that the, the cross, the crucifixion, did not establish salvation. The, the Christians, many well-meaning Christians, believe that that event that occurred 2,000 years ago was for all mankind, and it... it it literally saved everyone. All the people were were saved by that event. And Jesus is saying, no, it's, it's actually the resurrection. You know, you don't reach heaven through death. You reach heaven through life and forgiveness. Doesn't that make intuitive sense? If you're going to eternal life, you're going to go through the tube of life. <laughs> Not through the death tube. <laughs> You don't reach life through death. You reach life through forgiveness and resurrection. And what resurrection is, is atonement. So let me give you a reinterpretation of the cross. Because I was raised Christian too, and I heard all that for a lot of years. <laughs> the cross is the intersection of the horizontal plane of time and space and the vertical plane of the miracle. And when you are going through this suffering, you are seeing yourself and your husband on that timeline. You're on the horizontal beam. And the horizontal beam is where the arms, you know, are, are strapped down for Jesus. But there, there is no correction to be found in the horizontal. That event that occurred of Jesus bleeding and dying on the cross was, was part of a, a story that was even used where he was put in the, in the grave and then he, he rose again, and symbolically. He came back, which is not common on this planet. <laughs> and not very, not very common at all. It'd be like your husband killing himself and then coming to you and visiting you and going, well, I did it, but I, I raised. <laughs> Yipes! <laughs> you know, are you a ghost? I'm back. <laughs> you know, this resurrection is in the mind. That's what that vertical beam is. And that's what all of my talks are about. And that's what all these movies are pointing to, is the power of the mind. And the power to forgive, and the power to accept the resurrection, and the power to remember, oh, the resurrection is the correction. Errors can be corrected. Errors have been corrected. Have been corrected. Hallelujah, errors have been corrected. If it's true that errors have been corrected, then it must be that I have one responsibility to accept the correction. Jesus says, you are not responsible for the error. You are responsible for accepting the correction to the error. Isn't that lovely? Anytime you want to beat yourself up, anytime you want to get into that old codependent linear Oh, I'm not a very good course practitioner, and I should know better, and that wasn't very loving to scream at him, and all this blah, 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 blah. That's all horizontal. That's trying to accept responsibility for the error. And that is not our responsibility. I've even actually seen people misuse the course, where they tell people, you're responsible for those starving children in Afri Africa. You're responsible <laughs> for that hole in the ozone layer. You're responsible for that hurricane. You're responsible. I'm like, wait, what book are you reading? 
This isn't some new age mumbo jumbo about manifesting the world. You know, I'm, I'm actually kind of tired of new age teachings that teach that you create your own reality. Let me tell you right now, that's not a teaching of A Course in Miracles. You do not create your own reality. Let me tell you who the creator of reality is. It's God. <laughs> Let's get this straight. Let's wipe out the new age too. And take the whole thing with the crystals and everything out of there with one swoop. <laughs> the tarot cards. and Get them all out of there. You do not create your own reality. That is not a true teaching. God is the creator of reality. And guess what? I can but accept reality. I can accept that God is the creator of reality. So when you start to beat yourself up, you've got to come back to what that one thing I said at the very beginning, right at the beginning on the first night. This is the hallelujah line. Just say to yourself again, remind yourself again, I did not create myself. I am not responsible for creating my identity. God is the creator of my identity. I am as God created me. God is the creator of reality. I'm not the creator of reality. God may have given me creative ability, but that's at the spiritual realm. God didn't say, well, you know, I'm going to create you perfect. And if you want to mess around with this manifesting thing, you want to manifest bodies and spheres and time and space and husbands and wives and, and husbands who fall off the wagon and wives who stay on, and feel pain for husbands that fall off the wagon, and on and on and on and on. God didn't create you perfect and say, now, you know, don't mess around. God said, you are my beloved, and you will forever be my beloved. I will love you forever. You can do no wrong as a beautiful, perfect spirit. That's reality. So I, you know, typically wherever I show up, I wipe out a lot of things. But tonight I chose to wipe out the new age. <laughs> Thank you. And it's, I'm seeing the smile on your face as I'm wiping out the new age. And 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 you, of of course, you speak the truth, and and I hear it, and then it come. It's been this wave of insanity of of realizing that. There's nothing but innocence here, and it must be divinely ordered, and it must be in perfect order. And this just, you know, is reflecting all of this stuff back, and, and I'm remembering how grateful I am for my own sobriety, and that my peace is required, and that my peace is, is what I, I, can, I can do my work, and bond with Holy Spirit, and join with Spirit, and that's how I can be most helpful, and I'm continuing to ask so it, yeah, I, I just had to speak about all of that because it, it's just bringing all of this trauma story up, and the story is so tiring. And I was expressing that today too. I'm tired of the story of being tired. I'm tired of the story of being this being who needs to do all of these things and has these shackles on. It's just so old. It's this old, ancient story that does not belong to me. Um, it's interesting, too, that as I rallied people around me to help me, I moved out of my apartment at the end of September. There's all kinds of other things going on, and then his relapse hit on top of all of that. I'm being told that to love him is to not even love myself. It's so interesting how the world looks at this. Uh, it's just like, wow, are you kidding? And I didn't argue with it. I was just like, yep, that's the ego. You can't expect the ego to side with love in this, Robin, you can't. It's not going to. You have to do what really feels authentic to you. And that's been shown to me over and over again as well, that love is really the only answer for me or for him or for any of us. Yeah. Um, I did want to mention one more thing. Uh, Pathways of Light. Mm -hmm. I'm a minister at Pathways of Light, and they do have a weekly call that is using... 12-step and Course in Miracles principles. 
and it's a free conference call that people are joining who are on the recovery program. So I just wanted to mention that if anybody wants any more information. So. Beautiful. And that music video that Frank sh shared, you know, he used that word sanity in his song. That's what we're here for. We're here for sanity. And, and what was shared too about the 12 steps and sobriety, sobriety, that's, that's part of moving towards sanity. That's part of not using or misusing things or distracting away. So thank you. I really feel like, yeah, this is the second time where you've just come up and you've just been so transparent and actually that's the key, is not hiding it. When we feel these feelings and we have these thoughts whirring through our mind and we start to take it on in a very personal way, it gets really quickly down into woe is me. It, it's going in that direction. And Frank, with his beautiful music video and the violins playing, was, was drawing us, reminding us before this movie tonight, don't forget sanity. Your sanity is important. The next time that the ego says, you're insane, you reinterpret that, say, Insane. I'm going inward to sanity. In to sanity. Not insane. Cuckoo. <laughs> and also, the more sane you get, the happier you get, the more joyful you get, the more peaceful you, are, you become, and yet the world itself may point to you and go... Mm -hmm. The happier I got over the years, one decade of happiness, two, three, happier, happier. David's not playing with a full deck of cards. <laughs> David has lost his marbles. Did you meet David? Did you see David over there with that smile on his face? <laughs> so, I'm not telling you when you go into sanity that you're going to have all these witnesses. <laughs> they may go, mm, mm, yep. mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. Seeing that a lot. You're seeing that too. Seeing that a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So hang with that authenticity. Just hang in there with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Wow, aren't these adventures fun? We don't know what's coming for next tomorrow night, but we're just taking it one moment at a time here. So I hope you have a beautiful rest. I hope you relax and remind yourself of your sanity and, and think beautiful loving thoughts with, the, with Jesus and the Spirit tonight. And God bless you all. Thank you all for coming and being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you, God.